And um, this is a lecture for my uh, sixth hour class on the 8th of May. And uh, the Confederates surmised that they could get uh, artillery up there, they could blow the Union line apart, and they could have. And so it takes them all day to get ready. Uh, this gives the North time to just barely get enough men up there uh, to uh, hold the little round top. Uh, and the Confederates launched two attacks. One goes here through the Peach Orchard. A Union officer named Dan Sickles, he's down in the Depression. Over back east, they call that a swale. And uh, he's afraid that the Confederates are going to come up and shoot his men like fish in a barrel. So he moves them up here to the Peach Orchard and just creates a gap in the Union lines. And that's like waving a red flag in front of a bull's face. And uh, Mississippians... Uh, come across here, uh, the Peach Orchard. Uh, Sickles is up there in the Peach Orchard with his men. By the way, they still have that. I mean, they when a peach tree dies up there, they replace it with another peach tree. So you get to see the orchard pretty much like it looked on the day of the battle. And by the way, they're doing a lot of work at Gettysburg. A lot of things, you know, they've got the old uh, the maps of it. And, and a lot of things, you know, trees and things that have grown up that weren't there on the day of the battle, they're literally wiping those things out to make the battlefield appear more like it was on July 1st, 1863. But anyway, the Barksdale's Mississippians come through the peach orchard and they hit Sickles. His leg is mangled. They carry him off, smoking a cigar with his leg shot off. Uh, and uh, they drive right on through uh, north of Little Round Top. And at the same time, a group of Confederates under John Bell Hood and Oates, uh, the 15th Alabama, uh, they come here going south of Little Round Top, uh, but they've got to go through the Devil's Den, and there are a group of Union snipers there that hold them up. Uh, you know, it's very much like the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II. Uh, the snipers, the Russian snipers did such a tremendous job there killing Germans. It made the Germans hesitant to fight. It made them gun shy. Uh, and that's what happens to the Confederates here, but they hold them up long enough for the 20th Maine to get up here. And it's not the only regiment, but it's the main one, the 20th Maine here under Joshua Chamberlain. And they barely dig in before the Confederates come and hit them here. Meanwhile, Barksdale's Mississippians are going across here. Barksdale's going to be shot in the chest uh, and killed. Uh, and back here is the first Minnesota, 262 men. Here comes roughly 2,000 Mississippians. They've achieved a breakthrough. And a Union officer tells those men of Minnesota, uh, seize those colors. And I mean, they hit uh, Barksdale's attack right in the nose and stopped it. But they suffered about a 60 to 70% casualty rate, killed and wounded. That's the first Minnesota. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the uh, uh, Hood and uh, Oaks. Five times they charge up Little Round Top and try and dislodge the Union forces, but they can't. And finally, nightfall comes, and this place is just. And also, the Confe I just want I, I left this out, but the Confederates also launch an attack right up here toward the center of the line, uh, right up there. But but the Union line holds, okay. And of course, thousands of men are killed and wounded. You know, you can hear the shrieks and the screams and the groaning of the dead and the dying or the dying uh, men, wounded and dying, I meant to say. Uh, you can hear them uh, all across the battlefield. Uh, and uh, so that ends the second day. Well, while that's going on, 10,000 cavalry would arrive. Jeb Stewart finally comes in, okay, to lead. And also uh, George Pickett with 15,000, uh, well, it's called Pickett's Virginians, but there were North Carolinians and Georgians there, uh, some people from... Uh, Louisiana there. But anyway, Pickett brings 15,000 men. And Lee at this point is feeling good about the battle. You know, he almost broke the Union line, and now with these additional troops, he says, tomorrow we will break the Union the Union line. We will, we will win. So here's Lee's plan on the second day, okay? Get this down. Lee's plan on the second day, and I'm going to go over here and draw a map real quick. Here's Gettysburg. And uh, there's Cemetery Ridge, and Town Cemetery is right up here. And there's a hill right over here called Culp's Hill. Okay, Culp's Hill. And uh, here is uh, Cemetery Ridge. Uh, and of course, here are 
the round tops down here, little round top and big round top. And uh, by the way, after Joshua Chamberlain fought for his life up here, the 20th Maine literally went through hell down here. They tell him at the end of the day, boy, you did a great job. We're going to move you up here to the center of the line where there's no combat going on and get you guys rest. And while they're doing that, Lee is planning his assault for the third day, and he's going to send 15,000 men under George Pickett right through the heart of the Union line. Here's Lee's plan. First of all, he'll send... First of all, he'll send Stuart with 10,000 cavalrymen around Culp's Hill. That's Jeb Stewart, who finally shows up on day two. But his men are fresh, you know, re well rested, ready to fight. And he's going to send him back here. Here's the plan. And he's just going to wait here. Meanwhile, Lee is going to line 160 cannons. And by the way, when you're at Gettysburg, the Lee Monument is right here. I'll show you a picture of it. Lee is forever looking towards Cemetery Ridge. But when you walk up and down Seminary Ridge, you see cannons there. Those are not reproductions. Those are actual cannons that took part in the battle, okay? But he lines 160 cannons up here, and his plan is this, to you know, literally blow a hole in the Union line, wipe it out. And when there are no more Union cannons and no more Union infantry there, that stone wall up on Cemetery Ridge is gone. There's just a hole through the Union line then he will advance 15,000 men under George Pickett, and it'll be relatively safe. Uh, they will walk across that field. It's about a mile. I've done it many times. It takes 20 minutes or so. They'll advance across the field, and at the same time, 10,000, you know, the Union line will break. The Union line will break, and they will start to retreat, uh, and they will be chopped to pieces by Jeb Stewart's 10,000 cavalrymen, uh, those two forces will meet, destroy the Union Army, pivot south to Washington, D.C., march 90 miles, uh, hand Lincoln, you know, Lee, when he went north, I don't know if I told you this, he had a letter in his pocket from Abraham Lincoln, uh, excuse me, from Jefferson Davis to Abraham Lincoln, stating the terms to end the war. And the war will be over on day three. That's it. It's over. And by the way, these Confederates, feel it. they are in no way defeated. They literally feel this is going to be after tomorrow, after tomorrow, we get to go home. The war will finally be over. Well, General Longstreet objected. You know, Lee laid out his plan that on night two, and General Longstreet said to him, he said, General, I've been in the Army for 30 years, and there never were 15,000 men assembled that can do what you're asking, and this is almost a direct quote, can do what those 15,000 men uh, do you, uh, you, what you are asking those 15,000 men to do. He said, sending 15,000 men across an open field uh, against troops that are entrenched behind a stone wall, it will be another Fredericksburg general. And Lee supposedly said, uh, a lot of Lee scholars dispute this, but Lee supposedly said, <clears throat> the enemy is there pointing out towards Cemetery Ridge, and I'm going to strike him. Either he is going to whip me, uh, either I'm going to whip him, or he is going to whip me. In other words, no more Molly Cotman around. The war is going to be decided at this battle. The same night, Meade, there's a little farmhouse we go to. In fact, it's our last stop. Right back here behind uh, Cemetery Ridge, there's a little farmhouse, and that was Meade's headquarters. Uh, and they say he met with 20 staff officers there. I don't know how he got 20 of them in there. But anyway, it's a little white farmhouse. farmhouse. And Meade was meeting that night with his staff officers. And they just talked about the battle. And they said, you know, so far so good. But we can't wait here forever. And, and Meade asked his officers, he said, what should we do? Should we remain on defense or should we attack? And he went around the room and they all said, let's remain on defense. So far, so good. And Meade said this, we remain on defense one more day, which by the way, the third day was on a Sunday. We remain here all day Sunday, but if General Lee is still there on Monday, we are going to go over to the attack, okay? Uh, and so uh, as they were leaving, uh, General uh, Hancock, uh, General uh, Winfield Hancock, 
was in charge of the, he was the commanding officer of the center of the Union, whoops, the center of the Union line, not here. The center, of the, I need to redraw Cemetery Ridge. Is my map making sense to you all? Yes, sir. Hancock, you just put a big H there, he was in charge. And he was the last one to leave, but as he was leaving, Meade grabbed him and held his arm, and he said, General, if Lee attacks tomorrow, it will be on your front. He's going to hit the center of your line. So, so get ready, because if Lee comes out of attacks tomorrow, it'll be here. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, the, uh, the uh, discussion uh, broke up, or the planning session broke up, and uh, the commanders went back, went back to their troops. Well, so that takes us to July 3rd, <coughs> Sunday, July the 3rd, which was a horribly hot day. Did any of you go outside yesterday? Yes, sir. Yes. Was it as humid yesterday? Yes. Yes, yes. I went out to my mailbox yesterday and almost had to have my dog Otis give me CPR to get back to the house. It was, it was that, that no humid. I couldn't believe how humid it was. Well, uh, let me just say, that humidity there is nothing compared to humidity back east, okay? Um, and so it was a hot, humid day, uh, but it starts out bad for the Confederates because Jeb Stewart receives his orders to go around Culp's Hill, okay, and here he comes just in parade formation coming here, and just here south of Culp's Hill was a 23-year-old Union general. He was the youngest Union general. Maybe he was the youngest general in all of the war. Uh, later on, he would gain fame in the end of wars. Uh, who am I talking about? He's Custer. the leader. George Arnold. Very good. George Armstrong Custer. Write that down. He, he was here with the 5th. He's a Michigan man, you know. And he was uh, here with the 5th Michigan. Okay. Uh, Fifth mission. And he's just out there scouting around. And Stewart's got 10, 15,000 men, and Custer might have 2,000, maybe 2,000, probably not quite 2,000. But Custer, if you know anything about him, he only had one tactic, and it's find the enemy and hit him. Like George Patton in World War II. You find the enemy and you hit him. Uh, so, uh, here's Custer, and they come up over a crest, and they see Stewart's men, and they're just riding along like they're riding down Main Street. And Custer puts his men in line, and he yells to them, Come on, you fighting Wolverines! And they charge, and they catch Stewart completely by surprise. And what Custer did is he hit the very end, the front end of Stewart's line. You ever seen a movie where a train wrecks, the train's going down? And the, and the cars start piling up on top of each other. Well, that's what happens to Stewart's men. Now they just ran ramshackle into the each other's uh, the rear of each other's horses, and they were on horse. And Custer's men know exactly what they're doing. I mean, they're and they get this down. They defeat Stewart. They chase him off the field. This is some twenty-three year old kid chasing the greatest cavalry commander. He's outnumbered, chasing the greatest cavalry commander in the Civil War off the field. So already, part one of Lee's plan has failed. Meanwhile, the Union troops here, uh, uh, as the sun came up that morning, they're really tense. They're behind that wall. And by the way, the wall is still there. You go up to Gettysburg, that's not something that the Park Service brought in. That's the wall that they were behind. Uh, and they're tense, and they're waiting for the seven turns to eight, eight turns to nine, nine turns to 10. And finally, the weather gets hotter, and finally they say, these the reps, they ain't going to attack today. So everybody kind of hunts a shade tree or gets under a wagon to get some shade. And they're just laying around snoozing, okay, until about 1 p.m. Okay, get this now. 1 p.m., about 160 cannons parked hub to hub under the command of this man, not him, this man. Somebody asked me the other day, he's one of my favorite Civil War officers too. His name was, he's only 26 years old. He's not, he's eight, seven or eight years older than you are. And he was in charge of all of Lee's uh, artillery. Okay, He was an artillery officer. He's in charge of those 160 cannons. And uh, Porter Alexander ordered his cannons to open up. 
And boy, they just blast right here in the Union lines. But you know what? As I've often said to you, the longer I teach history and read history, the more amazed I am at the seemingly insignificant things that influence great events. About a month before Lee headed north to Gettysburg, uh, the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond burned to the ground, or burned, okay? And, and that's where the Confederates got most of their cannonballs, okay? And the Tredegar Iron Works, their cannonballs had a short fuse on them. So you could range it. You could say, I'm going to fire down here at that concession stand, and you could, it would explode right over that concession stand, okay? Well, the Tredegar Ironworks burned, so they had to bring cannonballs up from a factory in South Carolina, and that factory had a longer fuse, okay? So that means if you're about to use fire uh, cannonballs that are going to, from here, it's going to explode over the top of the concession stand down there. <laughs> These new ones take longer to explode, and they might explode down there in the middle of the football field, and you miss your target, and that's what happened here. Those 160 cannons made all sorts of noise, but they overshot the Union Army. Now, those guys behind that wall probably never heard right again from all that noise and the ground was charred. But if they're here, if this is the stone wall, the cannonballs are landing almost at the concession stand back there. Now, it blew up wagons and ambulances and horses and all, all sorts of things, but it did not knock out. The Union artillery here, nor did it knock out those men. Are you with me? Nor did it knock out those men behind that wall. And of course, this valley, there's, 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 it's not a deep valley, but it's a slight depression. If you ever walk Cricket's Charge, it's a slight. And that valley started, these are black powder weapons, started to build, you think, 160 can, uh, firing as fast, as rapidly as they can. Uh, and the valley starts filling up with smoke, and Porter Alexander can't see. So he gets on a horse. And he rides out between the lines when he stands in his stirrups and he strains to look. And all of a sudden, the Union cannons stop answering back. Get that down. You know, the Union cannons have been answering back, but they stopped. And the reason they stopped was with all of this and all this concentration of artillery fire. Listen, with the center of the Union line, what do those guys up there the center of the Union line know? They're about coming. to happen. They're, they're, going to attack. Attack. they're going to be attacked. So we better stop firing and save our ammunition for the attack. Are you with me? Porter Alexander immediately rides back here to Longstreet. And he, Longstreet's sitting on a fence, and Longstreet's just as opposed to all of this as he can be. He just said, This is horrible. And he's sitting there, and uh, Porter Alexander rides up and salutes, and he says, General, he said, if you're going to send General Pickett's division forward, you, for God's sake, do it now before the Union. We, in other words, we've knocked the cannons out. The artillery's gone. That wall's gone. There's no, you better do it before they can call up uh, the troops. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, like I say, uh, Longstreet, who is opposed to this whole thing, um, you know, just, just sitting there, you know, has to give the commandment about that time. Pickett, there's George Pickett. Pickett, he wore had long curls. He perfumed the curls. He'd just gotten married, and uh, his wife was named Sally. She was supposed to be the cutest girl in Richmond, okay? And uh, anyway, he rides up uh, with a plume in his hat, you know, and uh, <coughs> sweeps his hat off, and he says to uh, Longstreet, he said, General... Uh, shall I lead my division forward? And, and Longstreet is so opposed to this that he can't bring himself to give the order. Uh, and all he did, all he could do was just drop his head. He just dropped his head. And Pickett took that as a yes. And Pickett said to him, General, I'm going to lead my division forward. And he rides up and down this line right here. Well, behind those cannons, he rides up and down this line. And his men have been sitting there for two hours Back, just sitting back in the woods. You know, the woods are there to this day, just sitting back in the woods waiting. And as Pickett rides by on this horse, the men start coming out. 15,000 of them, okay, start lining up. Uh, and the drums start to roll. And they've got mass battle flags. And they are stepping forward. And, uh, you know, Pickett rides 
the entire length of the line, and then he comes back to the center. And of course, Lee, through Longstreet, had told him, uh, let me just, uh, there's the Lee Monument. There's that forest I was telling you about. That's where those men, and there's the Lee Monument looking forever toward Cemetery Ridge, okay? And there it is. Okay, this is the Union view. See, see the Lee Monument there? This is where the Confederates are. And there's that wall, uh, and the Confederates are going to come right across that open field. And let's see if I've got another picture of that open field. I know the, 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 there's a clump of chestnut. There was a clump of chestnut trees up on Cemetery Ridge. And, you know, they didn't have walkie-talkies and air reconnaissance and all the things that generals have today. So what you would tell your men is take your division uh, north of that barn out there. So you keep your division. Or what they told Pickett, they said, go to those chestnut trees. You have 15,000 men. Those chestnut trees are the center of the Union line. That's where you're going to pierce through. Um, and so, and by the way, as they're marching, the Confederate line's a mile long. You know how much space it takes to hold 15, and he might have had 18,000. You know how much it takes to hold 15,000? It's a mile long and a half mile deep. That's how big it is. It's a, it's, it's a mass of flesh covered in gray. Uh, but what they were supposed to do is that they were supposed to, as they are marching, as they're marching, they're supposed to execute what is called uh, a left oblique in the military. Let's see if I can still remember how to do that. I don't have enough room here. Anyway. You uh, you, know, uh, you have left oblique, and you turn, and you go a couple of steps, and then you start, and you go with left oblique. And both sides of the line are supposed to do that, okay? As, you got that? As they're coming in. In other words, they're going to start out a mile wide, but by the time they get here to those chestnut trees, it's going to be like one gigantic fist, just punching through, punching through the Union line, okay? That left oblique. Just like this, okay? Then there'll be one solid mass, and they'll go over that wall and split the Union Army, link up with Jeff Stewart. The war, the war will be over. Well, when the Confederate cannons stop firing, so here are these Union the Confederate forces lining up. When the Confederate forces stopped firing, the smoke started to lift out of the valley. And the Union soldiers stood by behind this wall and all those cannonballs going over them, uh, they kind of peaked up and that smoke started to clear. When the cannonade started, they, there had been nothing. They couldn't see anything but those trees. But when the smoke goes away, there are 15,000 Confederates lined up there. Some of those Union veterans that survived it said it was like the curtain raising for the final drama, uh, for, for the final act in a drama. Uh, and the Confederates step out, they line up, and by the way, it takes, them, it takes people a while to line up. But when they're ready, and by the way, they're in parade formation, they are shoulder to shoulder, standing straight up. They're not going to crouch. They're not going to crawl. They're going to walk across that field. And at about 3 p.m., Pickett rode out in front of those troops, and I think he gave at that moment the most magnificent order of the Civil War. In any case, he, he rode out in front of those men with a sword, and he said, Up! men and to your post and remember this day you are from old virginia and with that he wheeled his horse around now he doesn't make the charge he stays back which that's what commanding officers did but he wheels his horse and starts forward and the drums start to roll and fifteen thousand men step out across that field remember today you are do nothing today that would discredit what he's saying to them do nothing today that would disgrace old Virginia. And they began their march in what one historian has described described as the death march of the Confederacy. And by the way, it was a slow, deliberate walk. They had their guns slung like this. This is how they're going to come across. And they're walking at a pace because I've done it and many times. I think the first time I was in Gettysburg was in 1974. Uh, put those battleships in dock there. I'm going to walk here. But anyway, uh, you know, take, if you walk like this, go across like this, it take you about 20 minutes to get up there. Of course, I've never done it with people shooting at me. I might walk a little faster, but anyway, that's the way they walk with their rifles slung across their arm. And they got halfway across, you know, and they're cheering. The ranks are cheering. I mean, they think there are no Union soldiers up there, and that Union line is 
uh, intact. Uh, and halfway across this field, you're looking at right here, the Union guns opened up. And by the way, there's an insulating fire here. There's an insulating fire here. <clears throat> the Union troops, here comes picket men, the Union troops swing out here and start firing. And they've got artillery up on Little Round Top, and they are firing into the side there. Uh, and the Union troops are firing from the front, so the Confederates are taking it on each flank and in the front. And the Union troops are shouting out to them, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg. Uh, they cross about uh, right here. You see, a little bit on this side of that tree is the Emmitsburg Road. And when you get to the Emmitsburg Road, you know, today it's paved. But the image, there was a slight little depression. And boy, they had been taking it on the chin from both sides. I mean, they're, they're dropping by the hundreds. And finally, when they get down to that Emmitsburg Road, they're about 100 yards. You just have to listen to the football field down there from Cemetery Ridge here. And there was a young Confederate officer. His men were shot to pieces. There was a young Confederate officer. And he held up his sword. You know, they're, they're down there, you know, getting reorganized after crossing that field. And they're going to make the final push across Cemetery Ridge, and that Confederate officer said to his men, he pointed his sword towards Cemetery Ridge, and he said, home, boys, home is just over that hill. We win here, and we get to go home. Uh, and with that, uh, they came out of Emmitsburg Road, and they hit the center of the Union line. But when they're about 30 yards out, there's this tremendous roar. Throughout all of this, the Union forces have been holding back. And there's just, Lee is back here, watch, he's right there watching it. And all of a sudden, there's just this big cloud of smoke. The whole thing is covered with smoke. He can't see his troops anymore. And you can literally hear the screams across the men that heads, arms, legs flying. They opened up on them with everything, with everything that they had. Uh, and one Confederate general uh, right there, Lewis Armistead, and there he's got a big black hat. He, uh, by the way, the Union general defending this against the Confederates was uh, Winfield Scott Hancock. I think that was his name. His last name was Hancock. And uh, this guy right here, that go to West Point together, and uh, Armstead was best man at Hancock's wedding. You know, when you talk about this as a war of brothers, American against American, he had been best man at his wedding. Uh, and uh, Armistead had that big black hat, and he stuck his hat on the tip of his sword and yelled to his men to follow him. And he's a general on foot. Uh, and they come across the wall, they come across the wall, and the Union force with about 200 men, and somebody's got about 200 men, and the Union forces fall back, they retreat, uh, you know, and the Confederates, you know, are, are running after them. And uh, there's a young officer there, this man, Lieutenant Alonzo Cushing. He had just graduated from West Point four weeks before this, okay? He'd been out of four weeks, and he was in charge of a Union artillery battery, a group of cannons. And when his men saw Armistead and those guys break across that wall, they turned around and ran. And he yells after them. He says, ho, boys! He said, come back and give them one more shot for me. And those men were, I guess, sort of embarrassed that they'd run. And they turn around and look at their young officer. He's sitting in the saddle, and he's holding his intestines in his hands. And after giving that order, he dropped dead off of his horse when they came back and manned their cannon. By the way, in 2015, he was finally awarded the Medal of Honor, posthumously, Lieutenant Alonso Cushing. Now, I can show you the faces of the people that bought your liberty with their blood. I'd like for you to see that. Okay. But anyway, a young man, 21 years old, gave his life up there at Gettysburg. Um, Armistead reaches a cannon. There's a cannon parked there now on Cemetery Ridge. It's called the High Tide of the Confederacy, the High Watermark of the Confederacy. And a lot of people say, well, that's, Gettysburg is the closest the South came to winning the war. I don't think that's true. I think they still could have won it in 1864, and I hopefully we'll talk about that. But Armistead comes up, and by that time, his hat's pushed all the way down to the hilt of the sword. And he's wounded, or he places it. He's not wounded yet. He places his hand on that cannon wheel, and he's ordering the men forward, and, and he's shot. The Union soldier shoots him. Uh, and uh, he dies uh, He dies right there. Uh, and, of course, the Union troops rally, and they chase the uh, remaining few Confederates back across the wall 
and leads men, uh, leads men to uh, retreat. <coughs> uh, half of the 15,000 were killed or wounded in 30 minutes. Everything I just described to you from the time the Confederate cannon stopped firing, uh, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, and at least two women participated in pickets charge. They were found when they were moving the dead bodies. They were found uh, dressed in men's clothing. They suspected that they were uh, uh, there with their husbands. And they looked across that long field and said, um, this may be the end. And they chose to uh, dress as soldiers and go with their husbands. Uh, there was a unit there called the Mississippi Grays. Here's one of the members of the Mississippi Grays. Uh, when the war began, almost the entire student body of Ole Miss at Oxford, you've heard of it, there were 139 students, and that was a pretty good-sized college in those days, 139 students. Today, Ole Miss has 20 or 25,000, like most major universities. But anyway, there were 139 students, and out of 139 students, 135 of them volunteered. And those 135 uh, university grades, that's what they named themselves, the university grades, uh, they were to pick a charge, and they took a 100% casualty rate that day. The University of Mississippi was a city. Now, they were all killed. So there were some, some wounded. But uh, all told, uh, the University of Mississippi was wiped out at Pickett's charge in about 30 minutes. Hence, after the war, when football starts, they become, until just recently, the Ole Miss Rebels. In their football games, you would see people waving 50,000 Confederate flags in the sand. The team was led out by a Confederate officer on a horse. Uh, and uh, of course, their uniforms were red and blue and gray. Uh, there's Old Miss, uh, still the red, it's no longer, they're still the rebels. Uh, but uh, no, they're not the rebels. They've changed that. Yeah, they changed it. First, they were the black bears. I, I, I thought, well, that's toggle. But, but then, then they changed themselves to the land sharks. Can you imagine? being the land sharks. They couldn't come up with anything better than that. Uh, they don't play, they rewrote the fight song, they don't play Dixie anymore, they don't wave Confederate flags and so on. Uh, but uh, when you look at Ole Miss in the past, that's where all that comes from. Well, Lee rode out between the lines to meet them, and I think this is Lee's finest hour after Gettysburg. There were plenty of people to blame for this failure, but Lee rode out in like uh, a supreme commander, and he took he, he took responsibility. He told those men, he said, it is all my fault. It is all, this is all my fault. And then he saw Pickett, and Pickett was weeping. And he said to Pickett, he said, you've got to reorganize your division, General. Because he expected the North to launch a counterattack, but that, which they didn't. Uh, and that got me fired probably right there. Lincoln, you know, when he's, by the way, Lincoln's keeping up with this battle. They're telegraphing it minute by minute what's going on. He knows exactly in Washington what's going on. And that probably got uh, me fired. But uh, me uh, uh, did the counterattack, but Lee said to Pickett, he said, uh, you have to get your division in line. And he said, General, I have no division. And he never forgave Lee for that. Years later, he was asked about what he thought about General Lee and uh, as a commander, and Pickett's reply was, that old man murdered my division at Gettysburg. That old man murdered my division at Gettysburg. You know, Pickett's charge is the most famous charge of the war. It's not the biggest one. The biggest one takes place, you ought to go see it. So you're not sitting far from it. It's up in uh, Franklin, Tennessee. If you've been to Nashville, been to Nashville, if you've been to, it's just right out there. Uh, and the, the, the Franklin House is still there. And the, um, there's, they used it for a field hospital for Confederate, and the blood stains are still on the floor at Franklin, Tennessee. Next time you head to Nashville, just go up there. And I think 20,000 Confederates charged there. Okay, so this isn't the biggest, this isn't the biggest uh, charge of the Civil War, but it's the most famous, Pickett's, Pickett's charge. And one historian wrote it like this, just listen to this. He said, uh, Pickett's charge summarized the entire Confederate war effort. And here's how he described it. Matchless valor, initial victory, and ultimate destruction. He said that summarizes not only Pickett's charge, but the entire Confederacy. Well, the next day, on the 4th of July, talking about irony, the 4th of July at 12 noon, General Lee headed back 
south in the rain. It finally came to rain. He said he was broken. And he would never invade the north again. And of course, he rounded up every wagon and piece of rolling stock he could. He had so many wounded, but he still had to leave hundreds of men behind in the care of the people of Gettysburg but to show you the, the blood. Look, look, in the 72 hours, 56,000 men are killed and wounded. 56,000. You think Dallas can handle that in the next 72 hours, the medical facility? You think Tulsa or Kansas City or Los Angeles? No, no, they couldn't. And here's a little town the size of you follow. What if, what if some calamity happened here in the next three days and 56,000 people were killed and wounded? You think we could handle that? Absolutely not. But Lee's, after he had rounded up everything that could roll and packed it full of wounded men, his wounded train, going back to Virginia, 17 miles long, that's almost from here to McAllister, 17 miles long, four wagons across. And he still had to leave hundreds of men back at Gettysburg. Uh, and of course, to get this down, there was even more devastating news. Lee, Lee begins his retreat, I mean, almost at the hour that Lee begins his retreat from uh, Pennsylvania back to Virginia, and he'll never leave the South again with his army. Uh, war, you know, word came from halfway across the country that Grant had captured Vicksburg. As Lee is turning south at 12 o'clock noon, the Confederate officers riding out from Vicksburg under a white flag to surrender Vicksburg. That's what's called the double blow that hit the Confederacy on July 4th, 1863. By the way, the people of Vicksburg will not celebrate the 4th of July for the next 75 years. They refuse to celebrate the, uh, the uh, 4th of July. Lee defeated at Gettysburg. And now the North controlled the Mississippi River. The Confederacy was split in half. Just eight weeks before this, that's 56 days, just 56 days before this, Lee had smashed the Union forces at Chancellorsville. He had the North on the, on the run. He was, he was on the brink of winning the war, and now it seemed as if the South was uh, in retreat everywhere. Of course, there were corpses everywhere, corpses everywhere. There were... 7,000 dead horses, 7,000 dead horses. And of course, to feast on this, oh, by the way, that's a, right there. There are three men, you talk about people who have been through, I don't want you to look at them, there you talk about people who have been through the hell of war. Those are three Confederates who were captured. That's taken, that's taken while the shooting is still going on at Pickett's Charge. They, there are three men, three Confederates who made and survived Pickett's Charge, okay? Three Confederates who made it. You want to see the face of war? I mean, those guys have been through through uh, hell on earth. They experienced something that most human beings, most human beings never will. Um, but anyway, you know, there were no buzzards in Pennsylvania until Gettysburg. And uh, the uh, there's a turkey buzzard right there. Uh, it took months. They, look, kids would be playing in the fields around Gettysburg 25 years after the battle and trip, you know, you get out in the woods, but trip and pull up the chest cavity and skull of a dead soldier from Gettysburg 25 years later. I think in many ways, they're just getting that taken care of. And by the way, when you go to Gettysburg, be very respectful. Don't be like a lot, be very respectful because you're in a national cemetery. Brave men and women died there to save this country. Uh, and anyway, there is a turkey buzzard, and they flew up. The turkey buzzard flew up, and uh, now <coughs> the National Park Service keeps them there. You know, uh, Pennsylvania finally got turkey buzzards up to the Gettysburg. This is a picture. That's the 50th reunion. That's right there at the wall. That's the 50th reunion of uh, in 1913 of the Battle of Gettysburg and there's a bunch of old Confederates and there's a bunch of old Union soldiers and you know they're shaking hands and I guess doing the best to put the war in the conflict the war in the conflict behind them. Uh, there were 7,000 wounded Confederates left behind uh, and of course you know it takes months and months and years to bury all the dead but the town fathers kept this down in the fall of 1863 because their town has literally become a cemetery now. They uh, wrote to the government and asked for permission to uh, create a national cemetery. 
And that's what Gettysburg is. It's a nag. Don't ever forget that when you're there. Because you'll see people act like fools there. But don't ever forget that while you're there. And the government gave them permission. They said, you can create a national cemetery. And uh, the date, get this down, November 6th, excuse me, November 19th, 1863. The date was set for the dedication of the cemetery. And they invited this man right there. Uh, nobody knows who that is. Edward Everett, okay? One of the most accomplished men in the world, not just America. He was a graduate of Harvard. He then became a Harvard professor. He then became the governor of Massachusetts. He then became the president of Harvard. He served four terms in the House of Representatives. He served a term in the U.S. Senate. He was the Secretary of State, and he was the ambassador to England. I guess that's a pretty good resume. That's, that's you know, most people couldn't cram all that in five lifetimes, and he didn't want it. And on top of all that, he was a renowned orator. He was considered to be the greatest speaker maybe in the world at that time, even better than Daniel Webster, if that's possible. Um, and so they invited him to give the dedicatory address. We're going to have him. We want to dedicate him. And, and this little town was just so delighted that he said, I'll come. And while they're celebrating, then they realize that, uh-oh, we forgot to... But we can invite the president. You know, there's a protocol that you go by. If you're going to invite the president of the United States to something, you invite him first. You don't invite him second. You invite him first. That's the way things are. They go, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And so finally they said, well, the only thing we can do. So they said, invite him anyway. He won't come. We're breaking protocol. Invite him second. He won't come, so just invite him anyway. So they invited Lincoln, and they're sitting there just, you know, getting ready for Edward Edwards to come. And you know, what did Lincoln do? He said, I'll come. And they go, oh, crap. So they run Lincoln another message and said, well, Mr. President, you know, we already have a primary speaker, but it would be nice if you would just get up and give. And this is what they said to Lincoln. They said, if you just get up and give, a few appropriate remarks. Who remembers Edward Everett? Who will ever forget the Gettysburg Address? That's the few appropriate remarks. Well, we'll talk about Lincoln's speech for a Yeah, I would have done all that and then I would have been president. Then you wouldn't have won the other. You have it. At the back of right here. Because I would have been all in a while. He was like, oh, no one's following me. I'll turn around. That's what all of them say. Go, Jacob. We'll follow you. There were some people saying, Jacob, don't move. I know. Maybe you want to see your heart. See your heart. Yes. I'm aware. Yes. Jacob did so 